Hello, my name is Travis Boley and I'm the Association Manager of the Oregon California Trails Association, or OCTA. Today, we're at the National Frontier Trails Museum in Independence, Missouri, which is right next door to OCTA headquarters. The museum was founded in 1990 by the state of Missouri. The building was sold a few years ago to the city of Independence, and today it tells the story of westward expansion. When you visit the museum, you'll learn all about the American West, from the American Indian presence, through the fur trade, through some of the first trail caravans going west to Santa Fe, later to Oregon and California, the Mormon pioneers, of course, Lewis and Clark. Really rich history told in a, a very entertaining fashion. Just to the north of the museum is a, is a grassy area. Today, the museum uses this as an interpretive area. Sometimes they'll have outdoor fun and games when they have school groups. But in the 1840s and 50s, this was a spring, and a lot of wagon trains would, would camp here. And just to the north of this spot, about another 100 yards to the north, was where Lilburn Boggs' house was. And Lilburn Boggs was the governor of Missouri from 1837 to 1841. And he's most famous for signing the Mormon Extermination Order of 1838, which led to kind of a small little Mormon war in Missouri that eventually saw the Mormons leave and go to Nauvoo, Illinois, and of course then on to Utah from there. But a really interesting side note about Lilburn Boggs is that in 1846, um, he became aware of a wagon train known as the Donner Reed wagon train. It wasn't known as that yet, but he left with them. It was originally called the Boggs wagon train. And by the time they got to Fort Laramie, he realized things are going way too slow traded in his wagon for some mules and made his way to California and he made it safely. It was also in his house over there in 1842 that likely a Mormon assassin attempted to kill him. They thought they were successful. Many newspapers actually ran obituaries about Boggs, but he survived. He was shot through the jaw and the neck. He was a tough old cookie though and managed to live out his life and is died and buried in the San Francisco Bay Area. Located directly behind the Frontier Trails Museum is the headquarters for Okta. At the time the museum had opened in 1990, the city also contracted with Okta for this building that was on the grounds, and it's been here ever since. It's worth mentioning that this facility was originally known as the Wagoner Gates Milling Company. It was a flour mill. This building was actually the locker room for the mill workers, and this would have been one of the, the mill areas. Right next to us still is the water tower that's been here all along, and we recently installed the Greg Francois Memorial Bench. Greg, of course, was one of the founders of Okta. He died back in 2009, but he was the guy that really got Historic Trails Preservation re-kicked off in the 1980s. After you viewed the orientation film, the very first section of the museum you'll visit is the Lewis and Clark and Fur Trappers exhibit. Lewis and Clark, of course, left the St. Louis area in 1804, came through here later that summer. On their return trip in 1806, they were here in the late summer. Um, the fur trade, of course, had been going on on this continent for quite a while, but those early fur trade trails were really paramount to the development of the historic trails that we know of as the Santa Fe, the Oregon, the California, the Mormon Pioneer, the Pony Express, all those great Western American trails. They really have their genesis in, in the fur trade. In fact, a lot of the fur trappers became guides for those early wagon trains. One of my favorite things in the museum is when you first enter the main gallery, you get this great painting. And this, this is a depiction of independence probably circa early 1840s. And it's wonderful because it really illustrates the diversity that independence has held since day one. This was a, the edge of the United States until 1854. Missouri was the end. And independence was kind of your last stop before you left and went into what was then Indian territory. But the Santa Fe Trail, of course, was bringing in Mexican traders. You can see here a Mexican depicted as well. Of course, Missouri was a slave state, so there's enslaved people shown here. American Indians were frequent uh, tra traders and travelers into the area, and they're depicted here, soldiers, women, children. Languages from all over the world were, were spoken here. People pouring in from Europe, the American Indians with all their multiplicity of languages, of course, Spanish and English were quite prevalent here. But this, uh, to me, uh, really illustrates what that life was like early in independence. And behind me is yet another painting that I really love. It, it depicts a wagon train leaving the area. You can see those ruts in the ground. And, and to this day, just to the south of here, you can still see faint traces of those wagon ruts. Of course, another place that an immigrant to independence would visit is the blacksmith shop. This is where they're going to get outfitted with their wagons. Um, Independence was ringed with blacksmith shops. Probably one of the more famous ones was uh, Hiram Young's blacksmith shop. And he's kind of come down in history and great prevalence because he was an African-American who had formerly been a slave who had purchased his wife's and daughter's freedom before he bought his own freedom and hung his shingle here in 1850. He became quite successful, one of the wealthiest men in this area until the Civil War began. 
you enter is the gallery dedicated to the Santa Fe Trail. And behind me is depicted the town square, the plaza of Santa Fe. Today it still looks remarkably like it does in this painting, which is probably from the 1820s, 1830s, the Mexican era, you know, 1821 to 1848 when this was all Mexico. Palace of the Governors, the church there in the background, the town plaza, it's all remarkably the same. The other thing that really know about the Santa Fe Trail is the wagons that they use. They're a little bit different than the wagons you would have typically seen on the Oregon and California Trail. This particular wagon, this Conestoga, has a, a bowed bed to keep the goods from shifting. It held upwards of 3,000 pounds, likely pulled by a team of oxen. Oxen are pretty powerful animals, pulling heavy loads across the prairie and the plains and even into the mountains would have been really no problem for them. And it was a, you know, kind of like an 18-wheeler of the day. This was a, a trade route. The Oregon and California were immigration routes. People were trading between these two countries and carrying all sorts of goods. The final gallery you enter on your museum tour is quite large because it depicts the Oregon, the California, the Mormon Pioneer, even a little bit of the Pony Express Trail. Those are the four major trails that followed what historian Merrill Mattis called the Great Platte River Road across Nebraska. Once all those feeder trails, jumping off places between Independence and Omaha, all those feeder trails really came together at Fort Kearney in central Nebraska and followed the Platte River all the way into Wyoming, followed the Sweetwater up across South Pass. This was a one trail really. I know we call it four different things, but it, for all intents and purposes, it's the same trail. Now the wagon that would have been used on this trail is quite a bit different than the Santa Fe trail wagon. This prairie schooner has about a 10 foot by 4 foot bed. Couldn't hold very much, uh, a lot less. Really your bare essentials would go in there and people found out pretty quick when they tried to take grandma's piano or maybe some nice dishware that it was bogging them down. And so a lot of these things got left on the side of the road and you see that depicted here in some of the exhibits around here that things are just discarded, broken chairs, uh, broken other pieces of furniture, what have you. People will just leave things behind, clocks that couldn't make their way across the plains and certainly not over the mountains. So people had to make tough decisions. They're here in Independence, they're getting outfitted. Obviously you're gonna need a lot of dry goods to get you across the prairie, um, you're not gonna carry a whole lot with you. It was more like having a minivan as opposed to an 18-wheeler. We really hope you've enjoyed your trip and tour of the National Frontier Trails Museum and the headquarters of the Oregon California Trails Association. Please do come and give us a visit. You're gonna enjoy this museum. Come see us next door at Okta headquarters. But while you're here, be sure to also take in everything else that Independence has to offer. We have guided tours of the square by a covered wagon drawn by mules. Of course, the Truman Home and Library are here. And the historic Independence Square it looks a lot like it did during the trail era. A lot of buildings from that time period. Come get oriented here and then jump off and head west.